Hi, my name is Bob Grinia and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Uh, this video I want to talk about the uh, shielding uh, for the Lugana reactor and also uh, what our findings with the signal, the two types of signal that we saw in the glow stick 5.2 in Santa Cruz that Alan Goldwater and Mark Yerdic was running, uh, the implications of that for reactor design and uh, flexibility of use for the product of the reaction. So without further ado, I'm going to get a dog bone. Ah, uh, that's my joke. All right, now I've got a real dog bone over here. So here we go. This is dog bone, and uh, this is uh, made in uh, uh, basically pure alumina, uh, aluminium oxide, and uh, it's quite dense. It's uh, a little bit lighter than the Lagana reactor. It has an Inconel heater coil here with a copper sleeve so that we don't break it, and it has a high density. Uh, cause tech alumina tube through the middle, which you can probably see through. Yeah, and um, what we did on here is this is high emissive, uh, high emissivity paint, and this is the correct way to uh, do emissivity when you're using a uh, Optris PI160 or any of the Optris families to assess the emissivity of the material you're doing uh, analysis of uh, with um, a known emissivity source. So that's why that black spodge is there. Uh, this reactor wasn't actually run, uh, but it has been held by Tom Dart and ICCF-19, so bear that in mind. Um, okay, so uh, there's been a big question since uh, we saw the data, uh, and one which was very, well, pretty damn easy to explain. And there's one that wasn't immediately easy to explain for, for, for several hours. Um, but when we had done the analysis and come to the conclusion, uh, really rather quickly from first principles, taking the data and leading it through to its logical conclusion of how you would build a normal uh, ECAT, uh, we obviously discovered that <clears throat> there was lead in there and the amount of lead was exactly what you would need to deal with the expected radiation that you would come out of um, uh, the reaction. I think probably maybe it was a safe bet at that time to put uh, a level of uh, radiation protection in there um, for uh, uh, expecting uh, uh, positron uh, electron annihilation at 511 kAV. Um, anyway, uh, that, that's, that's then, and obviously in Lugano it's like, well, well okay, so this reactor is sitting there, and we didn't see this huge signal, though well, certainly the reporters didn't report it, uh, and we didn't see any radiation during the course of the uh, 32 days, according to the report. So the question is, what happened to the radiation? You know, you could conclude that we didn't see anything and we, we just happened to have an incredibly ridiculous thing that just happened at the time that we saw apparent excess heat. Uh, or you could say maybe the, the reactor uh, uh, structure was different. Now it's very interesting, uh, in, the, in the first video I put forward, I, I drew some slides from Norman Cook's Jap Japanese uh, presentation, where he talked about the uh, extension to the Mossbauer resonance uh, theory for the Rossi effect. And one of the things that he was talking about in there was the elements that were in the fuel. And there was a slide where he said, these elements are known to be within the fuel, or to be in the fuel. And then the word known was in bold, and it was underlined. I don't know how more obvious you could have made it. Anyway, I clocked this pretty much immediately, and I asked for some feelers to take out, go out there. And, uh, I really like Norman Cook, I like his uh, uh, theory, and I had the pleasure of uh, sharing the backseat of the car at ICCF18 with him, he's a very affable fella. And I was hoping maybe if someone else could do it, I could do it, but anyway, someone else came in very quickly, and they said, um, well, yeah, you're right, it wasn't in the fuel, it was in the structure of the reactor. Now, what am I talking about? Well, what I'd worked out was, you would need one millimeter, or thereabouts, a little bit more, to block all of the radiation we were seeing from the post uh, 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 Trace 7 pulse. And uh, uh, what uh, Norman Cook had in his paper as one of the things that were in the fuel, that turned out to be in the reactor structure, uh, was tungsten. Tungsten, okay, it's the same thing that we worked out we needed to protect this, and he said it was part of the reactor structure. So uh, that's fine because that deals with the radiation you would see uh, after uh, this initial pulse. But why didn't we see the initial pulse? Well, um, what we found in, 
uh, BAM, which we did at the beginning of last year in uh, Minnesota at uh, our Hunt Utilities Group, was uh, we had a, an experiment that was frozen in time. It was frozen in time because we had a, an alumina tube sitting in a silicon carbide element, and when it got to the right temperature, it was bag loads of pressure in there because we put a lot of lithium and aluminium hydride in there. And it failed for whatever reason, and we called that bang. But what it did is a piece of serendipity, and it told us so much, and I referred to this in my first video, where it told us that the lithium aluminium hydrogen had dissolved nickel in it. And this was on the surface of this sintered uh, uh, carbon or nickel structure. So we had a, a moment frozen time that was incredibly informative to our future uh, research. And essentially, what that kind of suggests to you is that maybe the fuel could be pre-processed. And Axel, Axel, well done, you, 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 you were onto this quite early on. And so how did Rossi uh, um, uh, pre-process the fuel so that then he could, you know, uh, put it in the reactor? Well, I'm going to do another specific video on some evidence that is out there and has been out there for very many years, uh, which is a very, very clean indicator that you can uh, prep the material and it will, it will be active. Okay? So when, when I go through the entire uh, uh, theory section of the, uh, this information release in the, in the Symphony of the New Fire document, you will understand that this is technically possible and that there is uh, already historical evidence that can only really be explained by the, the notion that you can pre-process the fuel. So he came with some powdered fuel in an envelope, this is as the story goes, and uh, he then put that in there. So uh, if you imagine that there was a, mm, uh, protons or beta emissions or whatever, they were maybe being protected by this skin that was on the outside. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up the evidence, but I want I, I know it's out there, and I think some of you guys can find it. So I want to I want to give you an opportunity to find that that evidence and see if you can uh, come to the same conclusions independently. I don't want to leave you on that. Okay, so that's this reactor, uh, and we dealt with the radiation issues. Uh, another thing is that I, I just want to talk about it. So I'm going to draw an image on the the whiteboard over here. Um, and essentially, uh, there was various questions and, and needing some focus about uh, why you would uh, build the reactor in a certain way. So imagine we're in the Lagano reactor. I'm just going to grab this. Uh, we're in our Lagano reactor here. Blah blah blah. I'm going to blow this up. Um, and there are a couple of options for where the um, uh, the tungsten can be. But for sake of a better argument, I'm going to like, draw the centre of our uh, reactor, and I'm going to draw our uh, our tungsten uh, sheath here. Then maybe we've got some more alumina, and then we've probably got our heater ovens, which I'm going to draw the little red ring circles here. Ta -da! Okay, so we've got our tungsten, and so what's happening out here? You're getting um, a selection of photons, and that probably depends on the material that you're using in your fuel, and that will come in the theory section later, and I'm going to do another video after this where I'll talk about another type of uh, technology uh, that's very much in the, in the uh, public eye uh, in this field, um, where they, they're, they're probably seeing different photons for a different reason, or certainly they're engineering them to be the photons they want. Uh, okay, so you've got your, heat, your fuel in here, uh, this is heating it up and you're getting your photons of a range of frequencies that's probably uh, driven by the, in our last video we are talking about the mass that would help it a little, um, or the temperature. So they're coming out, they're heating this up and you're getting some terahertz frequency uh, back radiation. Okay, And the reason you want this as close as you do to the outside of the reactor is that you want this to come back um, uh, uh, as least attenuated as possible, um, and, and then you're cooling to the outside of the reactor. So, uh, what's our aluminum color? Let's say our aluminum color is here. So, we've got our ziggy, ziggy, ziggy back, back thing here. Um, you've got heat being coming through this volume here. Uh, so, the hottest bit will still be just like it was in the lead uh, shielded uh, hot, uh, ECAT. Um, the hottest bit is closest to the reactor, that's the bit that gets affected by the reaction, this is the coolest bit. So when you would turn the power off, 
uh, uh, then then the, this would uh, basically uh, keep the reaction going for a little while, like keep that going until the, the balance gets below the point at which it can self-sustain. Now, uh, I have one other point here, and that's again coming back to the radiation. I think you will find that you will see more radiation if you cycle it. And that, in my opinion, is why the reactor in Lugano was held at a permanent input power. Okay, so, if we're saying we're accepting, let's just, just accept the fact that this is a reaction, it's real, and it's creating these range of photons, uh, which we've yet to, to describe, um, let's see what that would enable us in terms of reactor design. So you just, you just go from that point, and I've been saying over the last few days, well, basically, the rest is engineering. Um, and, and it's so important that more people start thinking about this. Um, now I have... There we go. I, I think what I'll do is actually move this, because it will be better to be able to... <laughs> Okay. Um, sorry, but... <laughs> okay. So uh, no laughing. This is a serious reactor. Actually, I'm going to stop right now. I've got my friend Dan here. He's come over from Norway. He works on an oil platform in the North Sea. Come here, Dan. Yeah. So Dan, before I tell you about all the different wonderful things that uh, you can make with this technology, how do you feel about losing your job? If it's a benefit of uh, uh, us and uh, environmental, it's uh, probably good. That's the right answer. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so this is our reactor. Uh, and what we've got here is, it's kind of like a, the original bang experiment, but just like study. So we've got a swage lock on the end here, we've got a pass through, which is actually basically, you're putting the uh, uh, power onto uh, you know, some sort of a resistive element in there, uh, and you are uh, got a ceramic here, and uh, that's going to heat up the powder in there. Let's put some powder in there. This is powder. Powder. It's curly powder. This powder. All right. So, uh, uh, and I'll come on to why certain things are a certain way by looking at other reactors. Anyway, this is the this is the design that I, I'm just suggesting here. And the idea of using alumina, uh, or I don't know, uh, uh, sapphire or something, um, is we want, we want to let out as much radiation as we possibly can. Maybe, maybe a, a metal would do it. Just a little bit of research and you would be able to parameterize what it is. Uh, and, you know, it may already be done, I bet it's already been done. Um, and so this is, this is uh, our, our reaction vessel. And what are these lines here? Well, these are lines uh, which are representing uh, cylinders that are running around this. And it's a bit like the fusion, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, I wrote two letters down there, I can't remember what it is. Focus fusion, focus fusion, right? And they're, they're doing a neutronic fusion uh, with boron, I think. Um, if I get that wrong, you can, you can flame me on it. Um, and so they're doing a, a different type of a neutronic fusion. And what they've got in their reactor is they've got layers of uh, conductors um, and you get a potential between the two as your x-rays come out. So here we go, we've got our photons coming out, blah, 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 blah. And depending on the materials, you can uh, do a potential there. Now, this is a, 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 something I was reminded of by Pekka Yuhanan, and uh, uh, he made an article the other day that reminded me of this. So um, uh, thank you, Pekka. Uh, you were bang on with this. And, uh, but you, you might be asking, what's this thing at the top here that looks like, oh, I don't know, it looks like a door that's broken or something. Anyway, what I've, what I've got there is, you can imagine this is up here somewhere, and this is your tungsten sheath. Okay? And what we do is like, oh, I'm fed up with electricity, I don't want any more electricity, and I'm going to move this down here, and I'm going to create some heat. There we go. Mm, electricity, heat. Electricity, heat. Yeah? Okay, so that's that reactor. Um, and this, this could be probably no bigger than this pen. 
Like a, I mean, that is bigger than this pen, but it could be bigger than the bow so. Okay, so the next one I want to show you is what am I looking at here? If anyone's seen the MFMP Goran reactor that I doodled the other day, um, uh, oh, by the way, uh, we, we, the, I'll talk about the next reactor in a so what we've got in here, this is, this is a bit like an extended MFMP Goran reactor. Uh, and uh, what it is, it's a, it's a big flat plate. You've got your, your fuel drawer in there, and you've got a, a heating element underneath. You would do one on the other side as well, so it'd be like double-sided. It's just, just, just good because you've got the heater, and you've got the ability to get the X-rays going in both ways, or the photons. So um, uh, essentially you've got the power in the middle and so on. But in this instance again, what you're trying to maximize is the x-rays that are coming out. And what am I looking at here? Well, like I might put a charge potential on that to accelerate uh, more photons, uh, sorry, electrons, uh, sorry, beta rays uh, to create Bremsstrahlung radiation to then be able to promote the electricity generation. In this one, we're doing a similar thing. So we can put a field potential uh, across <coughs> Uh, this one, so whatever, and plus or minus, I'm, you're, you guys are the scientists. Um, and uh, we then join these two together and give a different field when it's running in self-sustain, and or, or even when it's not, um, when it's, you're just tailing off. And um, what we've got is we've got flow water through some sort of channel that's optimized for its position in here. And as this water goes through, uh, it is being, oh, I need a rip pin. It is being exposed to uh, photons of ionizing potential. And what that's doing is it's sterilizing the water. And it's not even necessarily having to heat it that much. So what this would allow you to do, for instance, is to have a swimming pool without ozone or really nasty chlorine that gets in your kids' eyes and they cry and it's upsetting. That's what that allows, okay? So um, just, just get, get your thinking caps out. Just accept what's being said. And uh, you can come up with all kinds of designs and publish them, please. Quick. Uh, okay, so what am I looking at here? This is a, a designer reactor, and I, I will draw up the um, uh, rough drawings and some visualizations of this. But essentially, what we've got here is uh, we have one cylinder which you could mill. Uh, sorry, mill. It's just a cylinder. You could you could drill it out of a billet or something. Uh, so that's, that's on the outside here, I'll just highlight that, so uh, one here, this, this is an outer cylinder, then you've got like a flange on here and a flange on here, and this, this again could be made out of a billet of, of material, um, and this can scale in and on like that, you've got two different aspects of which you can change here, and um, uh, essentially uh, the active materials here, and I'll, I'll talk about that, about how that uh, uh, is on there. And so then what you do is this, this squiggly line around here is a well line, and what we're going to put in here is our heater element that goes in through into a well like that, and maybe by measuring the resistance you'll have a, a proxy for the temperature in there as well. So you've got your heat, you've got your gradient through the fuel, out to the outside, and what this bit at the top is here, I think, I think maybe this is the inside too, uh, the fuel is uh, the blue bit there, three, and the <coughs> heater element inside the center is four. And then right at the top here, we're going to have another green one. This is another sleeve. It's another sleeve. It's just like this inside sleeve here. So we call this five. So this is five. That's a sleeve, and that goes over here. And what we've got around here is more fuel. And then you put another outer sheath on top of that. And then you go, 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 go. Yeah? So, like, this one starts up, it gets running, we've got excess heat, blah, blah, blah. We turn this off and off, so that one's kicking that one, but that's back, right, 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 reflecting to this one. We've got another one on the outside. It's like a, oh, I'm going to get it wrong now. Matryoshka, the Russians would say. Matryoshka, Matryoshka. That's for you, Alexander. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> And Alexander Provodov, and I know you guys are going to be re replicating right now, so good luck with it. So anyway, th this is a reactor design. I just want to take you through a couple of images to support this, just for those who don't understand what I'm reading uh, about fuel here and how that goes in. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to put that back. 
So I'm calling this a uh, presentation, should I stay or go? And what I'm talking about there is, should the radiation stay within to make heat, or should the radiation go to make electricity, or to purify water, or to eradicate, eradicate, <laughs> eradicate vegetables? You know. Um, I'm calling this presentation should I stay or should I go? I probably should have said that earlier. Um, and essentially what I'm talking about there is uh, should I decide to let the uh, photons come out or should I let them be absorbed? I can do work with the photons either way. I can uh, generate heat or I can generate sterilization or I can generate elect electricity. One of the options I've shown you for water, maybe you'd like to sterilize fruit and veg, you know, so it keeps longer. All kinds of different things that you could do with ionizing radiation. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so basically, you've got the uh, electromagnetic spectrum here, you've got the radio microwaves, and so forth here. Yes, yes, they're coming through the atmosphere. This is on Wikipedia, uh, again. And uh, what you can see is where we're in maybe up the x rays here. What's the temperature there for this kind of level of uh, photon? Uh, it's like 10 million degrees. <laughs> It's a bit weird because it's like just one little thing, but anyway, um, it's warm. Gives me a warm fuzzy. Um, so there, there we go, that's there. And, uh, you know, depending on what we do, we can shift this around also. So uh, let's say we have some material, I don't know, like silver vapor or something like that, plasma. Uh, we may be able to convert our UV and X ray down into the visible spectrum. So if we take our, our thing over here, this one, and uh, we actually change the sheath here to something that would convert the X-rays and the UV or UV or whatever's coming out, depending on the uh, fuel choice you're, you're putting in here. Um, you can then create a really, really bright light bulb that might just stay on. So that's quite cool, right? So you've got light, you've got sterilization, you've got heating, you've got electricity. This is how versatile this technology is, okay? So, um, so yeah, so you can get that back down in the visible. So that's that, and I want to just talk about this. This is nickel foam, it's a very standard material that's produced uh, uh, for you know, nickel batteries and uh, other industrial uses. And I go back to my reactor over here. Uh, you could use it in that one. And we suggested using this a long time ago on a re reaction matrix blog. So if you go to our site, uh, uh, you can see that discussed. But in order to make it really, really, really easy to make these, so like you, you need a lathe and a, and a billet, okay? And you can make this reactor here uh, and a welding plant to the weld at the bottom. Uh, what we do is, like Rossi did with making pre processed fuel for the Lagana reactor that we discussed earlier. Uh, we pre-process the, the nickel, uh, powder, lithium, aluminium, hydride, onto this stuff, this nickel foam, yeah? And then that, when we've got this, uh, it's like a keyway, it's like a cylinder within a cylinder, we, we basically wrap it around and slide it in and weld it. That's it. You can make it in your garage. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you look at the links below, we'll, we have some uh, donation links there. Please, please. This is a, a moonshot, uh, and you can play a role in it. Okay, I just wanted to add one more thing to the end of this presentation that I recorded a couple of days ago. And that is uh, uh, what I proposed at the beginning of last year about making a cool cat. So essentially, I had gone through this uh, reaction table uh, process. It took about two and a half weeks. And uh, I was coming up with a lot of insights. And it was essentially accepting the Lugana report uh, data uh, for, for the outcomes of the reaction. And uh, starting from a premise that uh, Piantelli's theory was correct. And just worked through it. And uh, it dawned on me that uh, if it's just an alkali metal that's important, what happens with uh, uh, the other alkali metals and what temperatures do they decompose at? And I was looking to research that and essentially if you look at, uh, I think it's potassium hydride, it's 400 degrees and if you look at uh, rubidium hydride and 
uh, cesium hydride, you're looking at uh, 170 degrees for the breakdown. And that uh, basically kept me up. And uh, Kim came in and said, uh, you know, you need to go to sleep. And I said, I actually need to publish this because uh, it needs to be in the public record so that if it isn't already got a priority on it, um, that it uh, uh, will be there for others to uh, enjoy uh, moving forward. And so from line 482 uh, in the sheet, uh, I have the section called uh, How About Cool Cat? I'm going to zoom into that and I say uh, rubidium would, if theory holds, allow turn on at 39.3 degrees C, but like the even lower melting cesium to 28.5 degrees C, it's 11 times more expensive than potassium. But essentially what I was trying to do here is to get into the public record that you could have, uh, so in the Rossi reactor you add more lithium and then it, it reduces the temperature at which you have a lithium, lithium hydride, lithium uh, aluminium sort of mixture, so you can get that all the way down to near the melting point of lithium. So if you apply the same logic here, what you can do is you can add extra lithium to your, or sorry, extra cesium or extra rubidium to your uh, cesium hydride or your rubidium hydride uh, to get to a temperature that you would like to have an, uh, an activation of the process. One, people think, you know, because we're, whatever it is, 37 degrees or whatever, um, that, you know, things that are hotter than that are warm and things that are colder than that are cold. Um, and people think, well, if you want something really hot, it's got to be hundreds of degrees or super hot, it's like thousands of degrees. The reality is, zero Kelvin is what, minus 273 degrees C, um, and uh, when you're it's sort of above zero, like this cesium at 28.5 degrees C, it's already quite hot. So uh, this reaction requires extremely little amounts of hydrogen in order to, to make it work for long periods of time. So uh, what I was trying to cue people to see, uh, so that in everything else was then an obvious step from what I was writing here at the beginning of last year, was that if you got the right proportion uh, between cesium, say, and cesium hydride, you could have a reactor, you need the hydrogen in there, so it won't melt at 28.5, but you could get a ratio that may be uh, melted, uh, uh, well, so, like I say, if you have extra cesium, it will always melt at 28.5, and you get to a point where uh, it's starting to dissolve the cesium hydride into the cesium, and that's all over the nickel, which you presented, and, and so on. So, so what you would do is you would do all of the cookbook, uh, the recipe processes of treat, treating the nickel, like baking it to 200 degrees for a period of time uh, to get rid of the water, uh, to smash it up a little, and then you would be doing the uh, incredibly and uh, the most important step, which is getting rid of the oxygen, uh, and uh, also uh, to make things uh, you know, useful, um, you might like to get, get rid of, uh, sorry, do some hydrogenation. Uh, and that's just a, a case of a, a little bit of uh, experimentation. But what you could end up with is earth shattering. You could end up with something like this, here. Yeah? It's just a little steel thing. Imagine it's one of the reactors you've seen earlier in the video. And you put it in your hand, and you turn it on. And then you put it down, and then, I don't know, maybe it's got some electronics in there and you have a smart app, and you just say, right, I want heat, because I'm cold. Right, uh, the sun's setting, I want light, or maybe it's automatic. Uh, or now I want electricity to charge my battery. And what it would do is, you know, uh, you, or you might mean need to physically shift something, but again, these are just engineering issues. So what you would have some, effectively is something that could create light, electricity or heat, depending on how you are uh, utilizing the emitted uh, photons. And it would work at room temperature, uh, if it was using all the photons for light, or it was using by, by converting them to visible light from you know, UV, EUV, X-rays, uh, uh, to visible light, or if it was converting them uh, to heat, or it was converting them uh, via you know, uh, a, a series of um, uh, uh, concentric uh, um, metal uh, cylinders to say electricity 
you would have a situation where you have a little thing which you can turn on once and it will just sit there working and it will work and it will work and it will work and it will work and then what you do is you chuck it in the water and it'll turn off. It's awesome. So that ends the reveals for this video. Um, thank you very much for listening and I would like you, uh, uh, encourage you to join me the next time. Thank you very much.